Coming up on Capital Crossfire. First, an interview with GOB Votes from the Nashman Center to discuss ways you can get involved and vote in this next election. Next, our Crossfire correspondent, Cassie Corey, spoke to students in Kogan to get their take on the latest in the presidential race. And finally, our student panelists discuss current issues such as the state of the 2024 elections and the presidential debate between former President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris. Joining us today for our discussion, Nate O'Brien, a junior representing the National Center Group GW Votes, Stephen Garvey, a junior political science major and, a co and the coalition's director of Slingwa, Max Monson, a senior American studies and pol political science student, and Ariana Compi, a junior, a Middle Eastern studies major, and the secretary of Bridge GW. I'm Meg, and from the GW TV studios in Washington, D.C., this is Capital Crossfire. Access to voting and mobilizing our public to vote are essential parts of any democracy. With this election poised to be one of the most consequential in our country's history, we have questions about the importance of casting our vote, voter apathy, and the impact of these issues going into the upcoming presidential election. With that, let's turn to Nate O'Brien. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Hey, happy to be here. How does GW Votes work? What does the organization do to facilitate civic engagement and get students on campus involved? GW Votes is a nonpartisan um, coalition of students, faculty, and staff uh, that just serve to promote voter engagement and uh, civic participation on GW's campus and like the wider DC area. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, uh, what we do is we spend most of our time, especially in these election years, uh, planning events to uh, field a lot of the questions that students have um, when they're registering to vote. Uh, we also are comprised of an ambassador team, which is our student volunteers uh, branch, um, which is, has a ton of great people that we work with that uh, staff our events, do research with us, uh, make our marketing materials as well. So they're really the backbone of it. And then we have our task force, which is the faculty part. Um, they are like the heads of like uh, like different schools and um, different like um, different like staff and faculty members around GW uh, that we work with. Um, and we try to get people involved in a lot of ways. Our ambassador program is really how we do that. It's like a we will set them for a scheduling, uh, a tabling event uh, that we do with us. That's like peer-to-peer -peer interactions with students. And I feel like those conversations are really when like our work kind of thrives. Um, so we try to like really focus on that student-to-student -student interaction. What are some of the students, or what are some of the resources that students can use to register to vote if they haven't done so already? For sure, that's a really good question. There's a ton of uh, avenues to go down um, when you're registering to vote. What we use is TurboVote. Um, it is like kind of an all-stop shop. Um, registering vote. It'll connect you with resources to your state since every state has different um, voter registration uh, guidelines and processes. Um, so we use TurboVote. Um, it's on our website, uh, gdvvotes.edu. Uh, and it's also like just, you can just search up TurboVote. Basically, it's super easy. Um, all you do is you put in your name and address um, and you can register to vote there and it'll take you right to like the link. Um, to your state so you can online register. What is your advice for having a political discussion with a peer on the other side of the aisle? I think really our work is just peer-to-peer -peer conversations. We're really reorienting how we're thinking about um, our tabling and our interactions to be less of like, you know, hey, scan this QR code and, you know, do this thing on an app. More so being like, hey, what are the issues you care about? Um, what's interesting you? What are things, what are issues that are is paramount to you and how can we connect those to in the ballot box, right? So uh, what are some concerns you have about uh, students getting uh, access to their absentee and mail-in ballots on time? And is the Nashman Center doing anything to facilitate that process with packaging? Right now, all of our, a lot of our students are doing absentee. Um, like I said, um, we're facilitating, um, we're basically just having uh, those envelopes uh, and stamps readily available at um, the Nashman Center and um, places on the Vern. Especially with, you know, these, uh, the, you know, the candidates this year, you know, a lot of students still might be undecided and you're not really, you know, motivated to go out and vote right now. Um, do you have any advice for those students? For sure. I mean, if I were to say one thing, it's just, you know, think about what you care about. Uh, I, I do this myself, like, I try to reorient, you know, what I'm thinking about with everything on the ballot. Because it is more than just one election, it's more than just one person or two people. If people are feeling, you know, Less inclined. I just I invite them to really think about um, what's important to them. It's uh, important that we you know get you guys out and you know we're excited to give the privilege to you know let you guys you know speak to the students here at GW. Are you registered to vote in November? Uh, yeah, of course. I am registered to vote in my home state of Ohio. I am. I am pre-registered. I turn 18 um, in October, so. Okay. Pre-registered. Are there any specific like topics or world events that are influencing you to vote? 
Yeah, definitely. So I'm really interested in foreign policy, whether it's the war in Ukraine or the war in the Middle East. So I want to make sure we have a president and a Senate, you know, who will be strong on foreign policy um, and also issues, you know, uh, including threats to democracy. I mean, there's a lot of rights that got to be protected and I'm looking, I'm going to listen to what the candidates have to say and try and do my best to protect those that need protecting, you know? I grew up in a very politically active household, so I wouldn't say that, um, I wouldn't say that in recent times I've been influenced, but I mean definitely with, uh, I've been more um, excited to with, uh, with Joe Biden's dropping out of the race this summer, um, and with, our, with um, my opportunity to, to vote for um, a female candidate. How do you stay up to date on information for the campaigns? We've got the GW Hatchet, which is great. Yeah, definitely. I'll always look at that. If they've got some articles, I'll always go through those. Um, I'm always surfing through at least three different news sources. So, like uh, NPR, um, the list goes on. There's so many news sources, but I'll go through a big list, try and do my best to stay on top of it. You know, look at what they're putting out there on their own campaigns, their websites. And yeah, that's what I do. Um, I follow a lot of like, um, well, I have the New York Times like updates and stuff. So I get updates on like, um, with the, uh, with the, all that. But I also like follow a lot of their like uh, social media accounts, like on Instagram, X, well, I call it Twitter, but X and um, all that. Um, did the candidate change from Biden to Harris uh, change your opinion at all? Or like, do you think it created more enthusiasm or what do you think? It didn't change my opinion, but it definitely changed how excited I was to vote because I'm a Democrat. I was going to vote for our candidate, um, but before I was doing so with the notion that it's probably not an election that we're going to have a chance of winning. And now it's it could be, I'm not sure if I'd go so far as to say a transformative moment, but definitely one that people are excited about. Yeah, tremendously. Um <clears throat> leading up to November, or leading up to uh, his driving out, I guess in July, um, I remember watching the RNC and Loki being really jealous that they were very excited to put um, to put forward Donald Trump. I was like, I really wish there was somebody. That I wish I, I really wish I had the same enthusiasm um, about Joe Biden. Um, I just I just didn't. And um, but it, it, I was um, I guess recharged with Kamala Harris's uh, entrance. What's your opinion on the debates uh, for campaigning? Do you think they matter? Yeah. Well, I. Up until this uh, past June, I, you know, was, you know, kind of like a lot of other people, didn't think the debates had much of an impact these days besides, you know, everybody sits down and kind of cheers for their camp. Um, that definitely got proved, uh, proven wrong when uh, President Biden dropped out of the race. So I'm really interested to see now if Harris can use it to define herself and hopefully show a little bit more of a policy side because right now she's just kind of riding on momentum. And it's hard to imagine that you know, carrying the vote in her direction without people seeing her policy positions. I mean, if you watch the last debate, I don't really think it helped with anything. It was kind of like a little battle, like a just kind of insult battle. So I'm hoping the next one's more helpful and I hear more about policies and what they plan on doing and how they plan on working with a few issues right now. So that's really what I'll be listening to is, are they actually talking about what I need to hear or yes. is this kind of just like a little meh, 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 meh. Now let's turn to our panel of student political experts who are here to talk about the state of the 2024 race and touch on some key moments from Tuesday's debate. Joining us today, welcome, let's welcome Stephen, Max, and Ariana. It's great to have you all to the show. Thank you, Hayden. Thank you. So I'll get started with our first question here. So how do you guys think the candidates will reach out to young voters and get them involved in this election? And do you think that the youth will actually get out? and that it will be a, a big substantial factor in this election. So we're going to start with you, Stephen. So I think that youth turnout is going to be at record numbers this year. We have a very historic, on the Democratic side, a very historic candidate in Kamala Harris that she is turning out youth voters like we've never seen, at least since Obama, maybe even. We'll have to see what the final numbers are. Um, but I think that there is, with all the surrogates, Taylor Swift endorsement, uh, plenty of other stars who are going to endorse her in the future, that it's going to play a big role in turning out the youth vote. Um, on the Republican side, I think it remains to be seen what the Trump campaign will do about turnout. Um, I think that that's something that even to this day, it's not even clear. And uh, we'll just have to see. Um, I think voter turnout is extremely important in this election, especially as Stephen was saying, um, youth voter turnout. 
And um, there's incredible resources such as vote.gov where if you're new to voting, if you're someone like us who, you know, we're going to be voting for the first time in, you know, the general election, you can go to resources like that and make sure that you're registered to vote, which is extremely important. See if you need to bring a voter ID or any other, you know, questions that you have such as absentee voting or early voting or if you're a college student and you're going to be out of state, that's incredibly important in this election and we've also seen like the memification of this election as well and I think uh, Kamala Harris has done an incredibly um, good job her um, you know campaign to actually um, you know use that momentum to reach out to Generation Z. Yeah I think to Ariana's point Kamala's Kamala Harris's campaign or specifically her Kamala HQ social media accounts have done a really good job of targeting Gen Z voters and kind of meeting them where they're at. I think it's been very clear that they have people in our generation working those accounts. Um, I think, to Stephen's point, I disagree. I think the Trump campaign does have a message to Gen Z voters, specifically young, straight male Gen Z voters. They have been doing some very specific non-traditional media going on podcasts and other things that reach out to that specific type of voter, Twitch live streams, and they understand that if they want to have any chance of winning this election, they need to take a subsect of that Gen Z vote. And even though all polls and everything will indicate that a majority of the Gen Z vote will be voting for Kamala Harris, they don't need to win a majority. They need, if they want to try and win this campaign, to get a certain subsect of that. And they see that their easiest lane to do that is these male, young, straight Gen Z voters. And they are going out of their way to reach out to those people and I think it's more effective than it has been in the past, and I don't think we should underestimate that. I think something we also have to consider with that is the Trump campaign, I think, is using a lot of fear-mongering with Gen Z voters. Like they're saying how, you know, we don't want a country where, like Venezuela, social, socialism is the big argument they're making. But there's no real, like, substantive policy. Like, it's more of, oh, you don't want this, so you should vote for us so we, you don't get with the other side would be offering. The other thing I will mention is the abortion issue. A lot of Gen Z voters are not happy with the Dobbs decision from two years ago. And that is something that Trump played a big role in in pointing three of those five justices who, who uh, ruled in favor of uh, Mississippi or the Dobbs. So anyway, that, that is something that is going to play a huge role. Voters in this country, red states and blue states, support people's right to choose whether or not they have an abortion. That was proved in Kansas. That's been proved in blue states and red states, like I said. So there are certain states this election cycle that have an abortion ballot measure that will be on their ballot in November. And I think people will come out to vote for those ballot measures. We've seen that proven in 2022 and in 2023. So whether or not those people will also be filling out the spot on the presidential ticket, I think is the key to this election for both, for both teams. When you look at both of these candidates, they do have clear policy issues that you have to remember. And, um, you know, when you're voting for the first time, you definitely have to do, well, when you're voting in general, <laughs> um, whether you're a young voter for the first time or someone who's been voting for decades, you do need to do your research about the policy issues of both candidates. And I think there are certain, you know, key policy issues that can sway, you know, a voter towards, you know, both, you know, former, former President Trump and Vice President Harris. Other than his exaggerations about immigration, though, what are some of the key policy issues that the Trump campaign has been promoting to their voters or to their base? I think they're, they argue that the last four years under Biden have been unstable yes. you know, with foreign policy. Uh, he, Trump loves to talk about how there was no wars, apparently, during his presidency. But um, so there's that. And then also the, uh, the economy is a big thing that they love to talk about, which, by the way, Inflation's now down to, I think, 2.5% now. So it's now as low almost as when Trump left office. Well, actually, we'll get to um, some more policy-focused uh, questions on both candidates. Well, let's move on to the next question. It actually should be pretty pertaining to that. So after former President Trump claimed on the debate stage that Haitian immigrants were eating pets in Springfield, Ohio, several buildings in the town received bomb threats. What are your thoughts on real-life consequences behind campaign rhetoric, and you see violence or threats of, um, continuing as an issue in this election cycle. Uh, I'll start with you, Max. So. 
Um, yeah, I think to your point, the bomb threats that we've seen from that, there are real life consequences to these lies that form on social media. And we saw on Tuesday how things that are made up on social media can grow and make it to national television when you have a candidate who's as dangerous as Donald Trump. To anyone who's watching, this is not normal what's going on right here. This is, if this was 10 years ago, there would have been some sort of intervention at this point with some of the theories and stuff that the former president is saying. And there literally, there is no ideology here. To both of my um, former, <laughs> both of my colleagues' points, um, that you know, misinformation rhetoric can be incredibly harmful, and I think that's something that you know voters should be looking out for during this election, especially if you watched you know the past debate this past Tuesday. Um, I think you know former President Trump definitely did a lot of um, rambling, and I didn't really see any key policy issues that he cited. The fact remains that this race is tied. And we are a coin flip away from Donald Trump in the White House. And all that truth about this being not normal and scary and having real harm will be significantly worse if Trump ends up in the White House after no, the November election. So we know some of his plans. I know he likes to distance himself from Project 2025. I think we all know that it is his advisors and the people who are in his ear that are the architects of that project. And we can talk about how his behavior is abnormal, how his lies are dangerous, and they are, but the fact is he is just as close to the White House as Kamala Harris is right now. Sticking with the theme of the debate here, uh, with recent shootings in Georgia and Kentucky, were you surprised to see that gun violence was not discussed during last night, or Tuesday night's debate? Vice President Harris mentioned that she is a gun owner, and so is um, her running mate, um, Governor uh, Tim Walz. And um, I think, you know, it should have definitely, you know, been talked, you know, as a more, like, crucial point. I know the war um, in Ukraine was talked about, you know, quite significantly, as well as um, the war in Gaza against, you know, Israel, of course. And um, I think, you know, especially because it's a domestic issue, I think it should have been, you know, highlighted, especially after, you know, that horrific shooting in Georgia that, you know, could have been prevented. I think that we have become extremely numb to gun violence in this country because of how often we have these terrible, terrible school shootings. Um, I grew up one town over from Sandy Hook in Connecticut. I know the damage that these things can have. Um, and I've seen how time after time after time, and I know I'm speaking to the choir here, time after time after time we see these horrible, horrible events take place and there's no action. The Biden administration was able to pass some gun legislation to make some restrictions during their term. Um, it's still not enough. For the Republican Party, they would prefer not, just to make this a non-issue, and or they would like to add more guns. Be, um, you know, they feel if teachers are armed that this would solve the problem. The other thing is, is that the math for the Democrats just doesn't work out because unfortunately in the Senate you need to break a filibuster 60 votes, which requires Republicans, and unless the rules change or something happens, this this will not be solved, um, at least in a comprehensive way. Do you really think, though, that it's because Republicans want guns so bad, or do you think it's because lobbyists from the gun, from gun lobbyists, excuse me, and people from the NRA are so vehemently anti taking away anyone's guns, and they know they'll lose funding and support from that incredibly powerful organization? Well, now that you bring that up, um, no, I think that it's a mix of two things. It's a mix of the, the lobbyists, that they just have so much influence over politicians, particularly the Republican Party, on this issue, that it's just, it's just not going to happen with them. How do you guys think that social media in that realm has you know, affected these campaigns and you know, the, this 2024 cycle here? We'll start with Stephen, then we'll move down here. I think one of the benefits of social media is we could see everything that's happening in real time. So for younger voters, really anyone who's on there, they could see at a given time exactly what's happening, and that's beneficial. The, the problem is, is with social media comes, you could post whatever you want, and if you post something, a certain amount of people will believe you, and that is one of the biggest challenges and crises we're dealing with now is that anyone 
who knows if they're inside the country or not or who they are, can put something up that's just blatantly false. And there are a certain amount who, of people who believe it. And that's something I would suggest to anyone who is on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, make sure to check your sources. Stephen definitely made a great point about checking your sources, um, especially for younger voters. Um, when you're looking at news sources, make sure that they're actually from you know verified news organizations. If you're looking at posts on social media, make sure it's not from like you know this you know person who I don't know maybe you know has a platform <laughs> for disinformation, which is unfortunately a reality <laughs> in our country. But I would definitely you know not read into things you know too closely. But at the same time, um, I think you know social media is, is definitely going to be ex incredibly crucial this election, especially since, um, you know, Generation Z and a lot of, you know, young voters, you know, check social media platforms probably every day if you, you know, were to ask them. And um, I think that, um, you know, like we've seen with um, Vice President uh, Harris's campaign, she's definitely you know, like I've said before, she's definitely, you know, taken the momentum of the memification of herself, like the coconut tree memes or um, uh, Kamala is brat, which uh, Charlie XCX coined on X. And um, I think, you know, that can definitely um, entice young voters. Social media is a great tool, to Stephen's point, to communicate with voters. The thing about the way our political system is set up and this presidential election is the voters that need to be communicated to by these candidates are not the voters who are consistently seeing the content that they're putting out on social media. People who are excited to vote for Kamala Harris, who follow Kamala Harris and the Kamala HQ accounts and the great things that I think they've been doing are already voting for Kamala Harris. That is not, that shouldn't be the target of these campaigns. The target is swayable voters, undecided voters, people who are thinking about not voting at all. And those are the people that you need to be reaching on social media if you want to run an effective campaign. So while you know Kamala Harris voters eat up these Kamala HQ posts and the Kamala is brat and there was a recent one that was just four pictures of Donald Trump and then the Rio de Janeiro Instagram filter on the last one. I don't know if any of us could explain even why we find that funny, but we do. That is not going to do anything to convince the type of voter that the Kamala campaign, need, that Kamala's campaign needs to get out to win this election. Um, it's fun, I love it, other people love it, but it's not going to do what they need to do, which is convince voters to come out and vote for Kamala Harris. All right, so we're gonna wrap things up with our last kind of big question here. So, do you guys believe that students who disagree on the candidates in this election will be able to get along, and should they be able to get along? We'll start with you, Max. Um, who disagree with just the issues of this election? Who, uh, you know, maybe have, uh, you know, different candidates that they support and might have a different, you know, political orientation. Sure. Do I believe they should get along? Absolutely. Um, whether or not they will in reality remains to be seen. I think we have seen the political landscape changed dramatically since Donald Trump entered the scene nine years ago. Um, the Republican Party is not what it once was. I don't know if it ever will be what it once was. That remains to be seen down the line. But for now, in this election, can voters have different beliefs and still substantial conversation and valuable conversation? Um, I have not seen the case where you see a conservative and a liberal speaking to each other very cordially, peacefully about the issues, debating policy. And I think that's because that's not what the candidates are doing. We saw Tuesday's debate. That was not a riveting policy discussion. It was a bloodbath in some sense, in the sense that Donald Trump spent no time talking about real policy issues. He has concepts of a plan, as was meme to all hell. Um, so whether or not voters can get along going into this election, I think the fact that the candidates have no interest in getting along, specifically Donald Trump, we saw Kamala Harris have to walk all the way across the stage to shake his hand. Um, I think that is indicative of how the rest of the country is feeling about this issue. Yeah, to Max's point, I think, you know, actually um, I'm the secretary of Bridge GW, which is an organization on campus. We actually um, have discussions with, you know, many types of voters, whether they're an independent, Democrat or Republican, and I've seen students 
Um, and these discussions frequently debate issues such as immigration, abortion, things about um, climate change, and you know, in a respectful way. And I think that's what we expect from our politicians. And to Max's point, um, you know, Kamala Harris did have to walk across the stage during the debate and shake Donald Trump's hand. But I think, um, you know, like you know, what's been said, you know, this is not your father's Republican Party. This is a totally different Republican Party than the times of, you know, Dick Cheney and, you know, George Bush. And um, to that point as well, you know, I think that, you know, voters can have a lot of discussions about policy issues and should have respectful discourse about those issues. I think it's unfortunate that we get so heated and our minds get so clouded about certain issues when we really need to remember that, you know, we all have, a, you know, the same common goal. We all you know, want to live in a society where we have, you know, inalienable rights, that we believe in freedom of speech, that we believe in, believe in you know, the right to vote, uh, the right to certain, you know, inalienable rights. You know, we all have that common, you know, goal. So I think, you know, we shouldn't, you know, let these issues separate us because that is only going to lead to a more divided country where, unfortunately, you know, it's, the climate has become so calcified and so polarized that we forget that, you know, we're all Americans. We're all living in the same country. And really, you know, it's unfortunate that it's come to this, but I think, you know, in this election, we need to remember again that we're all, you know, we're all fighting for the same goal. I disagree. Um, we are not all fighting for the same goal. Um, I consider myself a liberal person. I don't think conservatives are fighting for the same America that I'm fighting for. You hear the things that they talk about, the way they speak about the issues. Um, they, they are living in a different plane of reality in a lot of sense. They are not working with the same set of facts that a majority of Americans know are the truth. Even Trump supporters. There are many Trump supporters who know how often he lies, how often he is stretching the truth to a very large extent. And I don't think I can say that I am fighting for the same America that Republicans are fighting for. I can say with confidence that I'm not. And I agree, we're all Americans. We should be able to debate the issues civilly, but I don't think that's where we are right now. All right, let's get Stephen to finish this uh, conversation here. Yeah, so I think we should be talking to each other. Like, I believe in like the power of listening. And, you know, if you hear the other person's point of view, you might pick something out of it, or at the end of the day, you just might have agreeing to disagree. Um, the other thing I'll note is, is you know, we're younger, so we've got a long ways left uh, on this earth. So I think it would be unhealthy of us to not work with others and for us to hear the other side out and uh, try to find common ground and to try to get along. I will just say I'm a registered Democrat and I will be voting for Kamala Harris. But what I will, what I will say is that you should look at, you know, these campaigns and voters should look at the issues of these campaigns and I think that you know in a democracy you know we're expected to have political discourse and that's actually the backbone it's very vital to democracy to have these conversations and to your point you know I think a lot of you know unfortunately a lot of Trump supporters will be supporting him anyways when they know that you know they know the harrowing facts of project 2225 and that a lot of his you know former, you know, officials and senior advisors have, you know, written that, you know, 180 day plan. But I think at the end of the day, you know, even though, you know, those Americans may be clouded by, you know, Trump and his rhetoric and his dangerous agenda, you know, you know, at the end of the day, we do need to come together and, you know, bridge that divide. Well, thank you guys all for coming on today. Well, that's all for this episode of Capital Crossfire. Be sure to check us out online at www.tw-tv.com and follow us on Instagram and TikTok at GW Capital Crossfire. For all of, all of us at GWTV, I'm Meg. Thanks for getting caught in the crossfire with us. We'll see you back here next time.